It doesn't matter what year you are. I'm head of the associates. If I give you an assignment, you do it. Hey, everybody. This is your daily dose of all things royal. Welcome back, my gorgeous, good-looking friends. I know it's been a couple days, but I have been doing some major research. It was all prompted by a video put out by the DUI guy. Now, if you haven't seen this video, I highly suggest it. I will put the link below. I will reference certain parts of it because the guest that he had on his show, Claire Best, gave some really eye-opening information that did fill in some gaps in this Meghan Markle saga. But on the flip side, she had some gaps where she couldn't fill in, and that's where the Royal Griff can come in and help. So before we get started, I just want to set the tone. As you guys know, there are many things that you can and cannot say on this platform, especially certain people's names and contacts. So what I've done here was I've provided a key to the people that I will be referencing in this video. So we have Hill Lyery, we have Willie, Bugman, Heidi, President Donkey, Bama, Dr. Evil, Sleazy E, Jabba the Hutt, Megan, Prick Harry, and Dobra. So I'm going to be tailoring my language just a little bit. So top of my head, there's certain topics that will get flagged if you outright say them. So we'll be referring to the C word as weather. We're going to be referring to those who take advantage of the youth for intimate reasons, PD files, and just bad behavior, such as DV or SA, we're going to, from time to time, refer to bad intimate behavior. And there'll be more of stuff that will come up, and hopefully I'll be able to explain it in a way that you'll understand it without triggering the algorithm and being suppressed. So here we go. Sad to say it, but this is the world that the people that I just showed you are really creating. Okay, so getting back to the topic. So Claire Best, she is the CEO of Claire Best and Associates, and I believe that they are a talent agency and they do represent celebrities, which I'm not sure how the DUI guy knows her, but I'm glad that he had her on because she had been, I guess, involved with Amber Heard in some way. Not directly, but along the lines of this Me Too movement. Now, she has assessed that Meghan Markle and Prince Harry have somewhat become ambassadors for the WEF. Not officially, but pretty much because of their influence and because of their global reach, they are sort of being used by the powerful elite to push this agenda. And she classifies Meghan into the same group with Amber Heard, Evan Rachel Wood, Emma Watson, Chessie Prout, and a few others, all to sell some type of narrative and influence a way of thinking per the agenda. And I've talked about this many times at the different organizations and the people Meghan and Harry are aligning and associating with. Now, we all know that Meghan Markle had climbed that greasy pole to get where she's at. And I do believe that along the way, she was desperately trying to figure out how to get into that A-list celebrity circle. And I believe that Meghan never really saw acting as a long-term thing because she didn't want to have to work for it. And we all have seen and know that Meghan is a one-dimensional character where she can only play Meghan. <laughs> The fact she couldn't get roles in different movies, not because people were racist, it was because she was talentless. But Megan, being the opportunist that she is, used her time on Suits to social climb. Now, Megan has said in previous interviews that how she got into social media was because the show Suits wanted the cast members to have these various accounts and connect with the audience in a different way by using social media and reaching out to them and influencing them to watch the show. As you can see in 2013, very primitive. Now, let me remind you that in May, she was still married. By this time, she's starting to jet set, coming back from Paris. She's hanging out at the Soho Club. She's meeting all kinds of people because the person that works at Soho House, Marcus Anderson, is now like her best friend. He's introducing her to all these celebrities and highly connected people. 
So by July, the rings have been sent back to her ex-husband, Trevor, and she is off. Now, let's keep in mind that the Toronto Film Festival official sponsor is Grey Goose Vodka. And what Marcus Anderson had done was procure an agreement with the Soho House for all the after parties and I think celebrity gatherings as well as when there was film downtime for people to go over to the Soho house and get grab a bite to eat or something to drink or they had cocktail hour. So as you can see, the Soho house is connected to Hollywood. There is Jabba the Hutt with Nick Jones, who is, I think, part owner of the Soho house. So this party was on September 9th, 2013, but there had been multiple events leading up to this party at the Soho house. So was Megan at this party? No, she wasn't. Was she hanging around this crowd? Yes, she was. So Megan was not at this party, not because she wasn't invited. It was because she was in New York and was with Jabba the Hutt's wife for Fashion Week. Megan detailed her trip in New York for her first ever Fashion Week. And not only was she hanging out with Georgina, she also was attending a foundation dinner that included Ricky Gervais, Tommy Hilfiger, Donna Karen, and Jabba the Hutt. Now, I didn't see any pictures of Jabba the Hutt there. Perhaps maybe they scrubbed it, but there were a lot of Victoria's Secret models also attending. It is worth noting that Fergie, Beatrice, and Eugenie supported this cause, and they were at the foundation dinner the prior year. This is not the only coincidence that Meghan supported the same causes that the royals supported or hung around the same people that the royals hung around. There are many examples of Meghan doing that in order to get into the right circle to bag Prick Harry. I know we've all seen these photos of Sleazy E and Jabba the Hutt and Heidi together with Randy Andy and his family. And they all were congregating at the Soho House in various locations from London to New York to Toronto, Istanbul, L.A. Megan frequented all of them. Here she is in New York. Here she is in L.A. Here she is in Toronto. Here she is in Istanbul. Here she is in London. For a few years, she was all up in the scene with the powerful, beautiful people. Meet Ron Burkle. He is the major owner of the Soho House franchise. Ron Burkle is also connected to the Yorks. Ron Burkle also knew Jabba the Hutt. Ron Burkle was also close with Sleazy E, and he was a big donor to Willie as well as a close friend. It's quite interesting that Ron Burkle wanted to buy Jabba the Hutt's assets. Could there be something there to protect? There was a rumor going around for a while that the Soho House was a place where Men could go and find lovely companionship. Let me just put it that way. So now this article in Gawker, dated back to 2006, says, Ron Burkle was friends with Sleazy E. Sleazy E hired me from a casting call our agencies sent us to serve drinks at his parties and dinners. Ron Burkle was at his apartment for more than one dinner. They were very friendly and talked about each other's planes. Ron flew on Sleazy E's plane for trips sometimes. And the purpose of reading that to you was to show that, one, these two were indeed connected, and two, they hired these beautiful women to serve drinks at parties and dinners. The the so-called casting agencies would do that. Now, these women, a lot of times they're young or on the younger side, and they are thirsty for getting in with these rich men in order to advance themselves. Is it possible that Meghan Markle was one of these girls? Yes. Let's go back to Tom Bauer's book, Revenge. In Chapter 7, titled The Irishman, Tom Bauer introduces a hotel owner named John Fitzpatrick. And he writes, the 54-year-old American Irishman was renowned as chairman of the American Ireland Fund as a major promoter of a united Ireland, as a philanthropist donating millions to charities, 
and as a friend of and donor to Hilary and Willie. Tom describes him as saying, famous for exuding charm as the benefactor of hospitality, the confirmed bachelor was frequently photographed escorting beautiful women and famous for giving them generous gifts, especially Louboutin stilettos. Media attention flattered his ego. So Tom never explains how John Fitzpatrick met or knows Meghan Markle. But I think we have a clue from this paragraph. So from what I gather, it appears that Meghan was Fitzpatrick's friend with wink wink benefits because he is quoted in the book saying, officially, I was not dating her. We were best friends. And it appears that Megan would be invited to be sort of like eye candy for John Fitzpatrick, whether they were going to events or if they were going out to dinner or if he was entertaining people. One example was meeting Rory McIlroy and they went out to dinner that night. And when they went to Cipriani, it literally was a table of girls, Rory and Megan and John Fitzpatrick. What you notice here in the year of 2015, Fitzpatrick asked Meghan to go to the White House, but he does say that to Fitzpatrick's surprise, over 30 friends arrived to this party and he asked Meghan to help serve drinks. Now I'm going to come back to this story because there is a political element to this, but first I need to talk about a couple other things in order to get to the political stuff and what Claire Best was talking about. So this is Jessica Stamp. She is a former Victoria's Secret model and was also a member of the Soho House. So Megan had been latching on to these Victoria's Secret models on her way up. As you can see, she was getting quite cozy and buddy-buddy with Jessica Stamm. Here is Jessica Stamm photographed with famed fashion photographer Patrick de Machelier. Now, this guy was accused in 2018 of bad, intimate behavior with the models he had been photographing. Now, the other woman that you see with Jessica Stam and Patrick is Rachel Chandler. Now, this girl, she was a model and then she became a photographer and had interned under this guy, Patrick. Now, I don't have any evidence of it, but it is rumored that this woman has been to Sleazy E's Island a few times and has been involved in this stuff. In 2016, she was the one who did the casting for Balenciaga. And what we've seen from Balenciaga recently, we know that there's some weird stuff going on over there as well. Now, we all have seen this famous photo of Grandma Diana. The last point that I want to make about Patrick de Machelier is that he took this photo. The point I'm trying to make is to show you how everyone is connected in this elite network. So now coming back to this video, Claire Best starts to explain that she believes that Meghan Markle is being used as sort of like an ambassador for the WEF. And she goes into talking about how Amber Heard was used and the similarities between Meghan and her and the people that have been surrounding them, such as like Chris Boozy and the use of technology and how they were using technology to influence the public perception and narrative. And it's these donkeys that have figured out how to use celebrity to influence the public and push them in a direction that they want in order for them to make more money. There is a lot of corruption and these people, almost like in a pyramid format, using victims and victimhood for profit. You have people, we've seen this over the last 20 years, that are in our government who want to take down this country, my country. And they are part of this WEF. The FBI, the CIA, they're all aligned with the tech companies inside the tech companies like Twitter, Facebook, Google. We are seeing these examples of private companies meshing with government bodies. The ultimate goal of the WEF, and they say it on their webpage, they're not hiding where they say that they want the actual global institution, which nobody elected them to be the global institution by saying the institution carefully blends and balances the best of many kinds of organizations from both the public and private sectors, international organizations and academic institutions. So they want to be the governing body 
of everything in every facet of the world, every industry, every corner of your life. The WEF is a fascist regime. And what they are trying to do is pass this off as a better democracy, which it's not. They're trying to convince you by having all these terrible things going on and injecting fear into the people and saying, hey, trust us, we know better. I want to show you something so you understand what is happening. So in the 2023 report from the World Economic Forum about global risks, so they're, they're laying out on this list the severity of what all of these you know, impending risks are going to happen and prediction. What they see short term is the cost of living crisis. Now, a lot of these are a result of the same exact people who are the ones predicting this. So you have manufacturers, you have tech companies, you have energy companies, you have pharma. And a lot of this is being executed deliberately by not only the governments, but also these private companies. You talk about the production costs, you talk about food supply, you talk about the people at the top, like bug eyes. You know what I'm talking about? The one who is trying to make us eat bugs. He's the one buying up all the land. He's the one saying you need to eat insects. So what's going on? They're making sure that carbon is measured and they're going to impose a tax so they make it more expensive for you. Do you realize over in the last few years how many crises we've had and want to say divisions and chaos that has been going on? I mean, in the U.S. alone, we've got a proxy war that we never asked for, which I'll get to that in a second. But we had the pandemic, which people who were in the know made millions off of that. Let's take a look at the top 10 of these short-term global risks ranked by severity. You have cost of living crisis, you have natural disasters, you have geoeconomic confrontation, you have failure to mitigate climate fluxation, erosion of social cohesion and societal polarization, large-scale environmental damage incidents, failure of climate change adoption, widespread cybercrime and cyber insecurity. Just keep that one in your head for a second. Natural resource crisis, large-scale involuntary migration. That's the refugees coming in. And then at the bottom, you have misinformation and disinformation. So when you look at this list, how many of those people at Davos that are sitting there saying that these are what your global risks are actually being affected by any of this? Their cost of living, societal cohesion and societal polarization. So you see societal polarization and division is a top on their list because they are purposely causing this chaos. So when we see the media and how they use the media and weaponizes the media and pushing propaganda, and this is what Claire Best starts to talk about. So she references this white paper that was done by Stanford University back in 2009 on how Obama leveraged the power of technology and social media to create a different experience for the voter and empowered them. The campaign's proclivity to social media was one of the major reasons why he won. So he understood the power and influence early on that social media had. And when you look at the model, When you see the run category is engaging online influencers to then capture or embrace a community. And from this, we can see that this was a catalyst to understanding that the public can be manipulated with certain kinds of media tactics. So now remember, in 2009, Hillary became Secretary of State. And at the same time, the Clinton Foundation had been set up and had been in operation. Crony capitalism. This is something that the Clinton Foundation has shown to be really great at achieving for self-enrichment. Why, you think that they are in office because they actually want to help the people of the country? Absolutely not. They're here to grift off of our pain and our suffering that they choose to inflict on us, which is what we're seeing with the WEF. So the Clinton Foundation essentially is a donor-driven foundation that masquerades around and carries a mask of charity and philanthropy. And this kind of setup 
created enormous commercial opportunities for them, to which they've become multi, multi millionaires. Okay, so I want to introduce you to a book that I've been reading. Actually, it's two volumes by an independent journalist by the name of Whitney Webb. It is excellent. And she fills in a lot of gaps that paints this picture of what has been going on the last, I want to say, 80 years. She begins in volume one, starting back in the 1940s. And she talks about the government. She talks about how there has been this system in place of blackmail, actually, S E X blackmail. And she talks about how Sleazy E rises and how she how he actually started. Now she covers the crimes that we are all aware about, but she also covers in detail the crimes that he committed financially that nobody in the media is wanting to touch. I mean, how many of us knew that Sleazy worked as a paid consultant during the 1980s and 90s at a New York financial company that participated in one of the largest Ponzi schemes in American history? So Towers Financial was a bill collection agency founded by Stephen J. Hoffenberg, and he hired Sleazy E in 1987 to help commit a billion dollars worth of financial fraud. Now, this guy... Hoffenberg went to jail, but Sleazy E got off and was never charged with any of the fraud. Many had wondered why Hoffenberg didn't go against Sleazy E, but he stated that he did not want to take the risk of fighting Sleazy E in court, mainly due to his powerful relationships and political connections. So from an excerpt from the book, chapter 19 titled The Prince and the President, it states, it's unclear exactly when Sleazy E met Prince Andrew. Sleazy E's connection to the British royal family allegedly began as far back as the 1970s and was forged through Sleazy E's ties to violinist Jacqueline Dupre. Heidi, however, is widely believed to be the person who introduced Sleazy E to Prince Andrew, and her social connections to the British nobility from a young age saw her socializing with members of the royal family at least as early as the mid-1980s, if not before. Several media reports from the early 2000s claim that Heidi was introduced to the prince by his ex-wife, Sarah Ferguson. Years after this introduction was reportedly made, Sleazy E provided financial assistance to Fergie at Prince Andrew's behest by paying Ferguson, former personal assistant, 15,000 pounds, allegedly, in order to allow for a wider restructuring of Sarah's 5 million pound debts to take place, according to the Telegraph. Stephen Hoffenberg, remember the guy that went to jail for the Ponzi scheme? He claimed that Sleazy E bragged of his relationship with Prince Andrew in the late 1990s and that he had met the prince via Heidi around 1991 in the United Kingdom. Hoffenberg has claimed that Sleazy E's relationship with Andrew was one of his earliest blackmail plots and that Sleazy E openly boasted of plans to sell the prince's secrets to Israeli intelligence. Sleazy E also reportedly referred to Andrew as his Super Bowl trophy. Prince Andrew has since claimed that he didn't meet Sleazy E until 1999 and has sought to downplay the extent of their relationship. Reports from the UK between 2000 and 2001 on the Sleazy E. Prince Andrew relationship are rather revealing. Perhaps unsurprisingly, many of them were apparently scrubbed from the internet around the time of Sleazy E.'s first arrest and subsequent conviction. These reports not only reference Sleazy E.'s connection to both U.S. and Israeli intelligence years before the first investigation into Sleazy E.'s exploitation of young people began, but also reveal surprising aspects of Prince Andrew's involvement with Sleazy E. that strongly suggests that the prince partook in 
elicit bad intimate behavior activities with youth to much greater extent than has previously been reported. Given the relationship that Heidi and Sleazy had to the modeling industry, it is quite possible that Andrew, being given access to attractive models at a fashion show by Heidi, was used to entice and tempt the prince, drawing him deeper into their social circle. Indeed, shortly after this particular visit, Andrew's relationship with Heidi and Sleazy E grew considerably. So the chapter continues into talking about how Heidi was a facilitator of Prince Andrew's social calendar and talks about a few of the relationships that Prince Andrew had forged with some very well-known names, but it was more of showing how Heidi could manipulate and lure men into her circle. So the author then goes into certain articles that were published in 2000 and 2001 that were scrubbed from the internet, one of them being by the UK's Evening Standard and then the other by the Sunday Times. And she writes, in January 2001, a very telling article penned by Nigel Rosser was published in the UK's Evening Standard. By that point, Prince Andrew, between February 2000 and January 2001, had eight recorded outings and trips with Heidi, five of them which had also involved Sleazy E. The report claimed that Andrew, for the past year, had been spending more time with Heidi than his own children. This article, in addition to a November 2000 piece in the Sunday Times, mentions allegations that Sleazy E was rumored to be affiliated with intelligence and both the CIA and Israel's Mossad are mentioned. Rosser's report also quoted several personal friends of Heidi and Sleazy E who provided telling insights into the pair's relationship with the prince. Rosser's 2001 article in the Evening Standard further describes Epstein and Prince Andrew as having a curious symbiotic relationship, adding that wherever Heidi is seen with Prince Andrew, Sleazy E isn't far behind. These quotes are particularly revealing now that it is widely acknowledged over a decade after this article was published that Sleazy E was seeking out rich and powerful individuals and entrapping them with underage people for the purpose of blackmail. The fact that personal friends of Sleazy E and Heidi at the time openly stated that their, in quotes, manipulative relationship with Prince Andrew was very premeditated and probably being done for Sleazy E strongly suggests that not only was the prince entrapped, but that this entrapment activity was known to those who were close to Sleazy E and Heidi at the time, and presumably British intelligence and other intelligence agencies. Now, we all know what happened with the situation with Virginia Jufri and Prince Andrew settling out of court for $20 million or allegedly $20 million. And she says that while it appears that Prince Andrew was deliberately entrapped as part of Sleazy's intelligence-linked blackmail operation, Rosser's article further suggests that Andrew's involvement with the young people exploited by Sleazy went far beyond his alleged three encounters with Jufri. For instance, Rosser quotes a friend of Prince Andrew's ex-wife, Sarah Ferguson, as saying that Andrew used to be smart when he came back from abroad. He started having a girl massage him. He even travels abroad with his own massage mattress. The mentions of massages from a girl and Andrew traveling around with Heidi and Sleazy E while bringing along his own massage mattress are particularly striking given what is known about Sleazy E's trafficking and blackmail operation. Court documents, re police reports, and other evidence have since made it clear that, in quotes, massage was the code word for Sleazy E and his co-conspirators used for SEX with the underaged he exploited and massage tables and SEX toys were frequently presented together in the rooms 
of his various residences, where he forced the vulnerable to engage in acts with him and others. So now the motive with Prince Andrew and why they picked him as a target, Sleazy and Heidi were interested in associating so closely with Prince Andrew and enticing him to partake in their illegal activities at this point in time. One possible motive may lie in gaining access to certain philanthropies. Hear that? Certain philanthropies. As the British royal family are active patrons of various children's charities. We're going to come back to this point in a second, but please just keep this in the back of your head. So the key thing out of this is the access to these powerful philanthropies. And it's one of the reasons for Sleazy E's increasingly public association with Willie during the same time period. So here are a couple examples. While Prince Andrew and Heidi were reportedly tying in New York during April 2000, Prince Andrew also attended a patron's company lunch for the Outward Brown Trust as a trustee on April 14, 2000 at Buckingham Palace. This may have also been attractive to traffickers like Sleazy E and Heidi, as the Outward Bound Trust is an educational charity which takes more than 25,000 young people each year, many from deprived areas, to climb mountains, sleep under the stars, and brave the elements in the wild places of the UK. The Duke of York only stepped down from his position as trustee of the Outward Bound Trust in 2019 and was eventually replaced by his daughter, Princess Beatrice. There has never been any official investigation into Andrew's time at the children's charity. Another reason Sleazy E may have promoted his increasingly public association with Andrew during this time may be related to Andrew's other roles during the period. Beginning in 2001, the Duke of York worked with the UK Trade and Investment, which was part of the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. The Duke was then acting as the United Kingdom's Special Representative for International Trade and Investment. This position had previously been occupied by the first cousin of Queen Elizabeth II, Prince Edward, and the organization was formally referred to as the British Overseas Trade Board. Now, these next three paragraphs, please listen closely, because we're going to all tie it back to Meghan Markle. In this official position, Andrew began doing business with executives from some of the world's most powerful companies, as well as major politicians in both the UK and abroad. In this position, Prince Andrew traveled throughout the United Kingdom and the wider world. For instance, in 2004 alone, Prince Andrew undertook around 300 UKTI engagements, including 148 calls or visits in the UK and 152 overseas. Notably, during this time, Andrew's relationship with Sleazy E and Heidi was at its peak, meaning that the pair would likely have been able to influence Andrew's behavior on these trade missions were it in their interest to do so. Significantly, Andrew's role at UKTI saw him accused of opening doors to arms dealers, specifically in Indonesia, a country where the Riyadi family are dominant force. For those that don't know, Sleazy's British mentor was Sir Douglas Lease, and he had been associated with a massive BAE weapons deal to Saudi Arabia in the 1980s. Sleazy's close relationship with Prince Andrew at this time and his own history with weapons companies and arms smugglers suggest that Andrew's relationships with Sleazy could have been a factor in the prince's promotion and facilitation of arms deals to specific countries during this period. Now, the royal family, as we all know, are not officially exempt from prosecution. However, the UK police rarely act when the royals are accused of crimes. And there have been examples in history of where they have done that. And it was around the same time that Sleazy E and Heidi had been getting quite close with Willie and Hilary. What is never reported in the news or suppressed is that Sleazy E was a main factor and driver behind the structure and setup of Willie's and Hilary's foundation. Another detail that the media has suppressed and not sure why they haven't blown this open was that Sleazy E was also involved in the philanthropy of Bug Eyes, 
So Sleazy is behind this new structure or philanthropy 2.0. And much of this new model of philanthropy has centered around securing pledges from billionaires, multimillionaires, and wealthy celebrities that are ultimately multi-year promises to invest time and money in businesses in particular markets, which are framed as having a high social impact. These pledges receive a lot of publicity and are publicly treated as philanthropic. However, critics and even supporters have noted that this is not philanthropy, not as the U.S. tax code defines it or really how popular culture has always considered it since the earliest societies adopted almsgiving to the poor. Key aspects of so-called philanthropy 2.0 are related to the rise of venture philanthropy, which is defined as the application or redirection of principles of traditional venture capital financing to achieve philanthropic endeavors. Such philanthropic endeavors are further defined as making investments that promote some sort of social good, like socially responsible investments, SRIs, to meet environmental, social, and governance. And you hear this term ESG, so or the ESG criteria, as opposed to turning a profit. However, if the venture philanthropist is also on board of the company and holds stock in the company benefiting from the philanthropy, as often it happens, there are ultimately few tangible differences between venture capitalism and venture philanthropy. It should come as no surprise then that philanthropists of this mold often refer their philanthropic donations as investments and openly tout the high return on investment those donations have generated. Hilary and Willie's foundation is a notable example of such philanthropy. It has also been routinely accused of functioning as a more sophisticated version of the corrupt pay-to-play political slush funds used by Hilary and Willie in the past. Yet instead of their past use of formal political fundraising bodies for these purposes, this time, they use what is normally a charity when considering that Sleazy E's earliest involvement with Hilary and Willie was related to their most questionable fundraising activities, as well as Sleazy E's own past of financial crimes. This suggests that his role in guiding the early days of Hilary and Willie's philanthropic ventures was hardly coincidental and also suggests there were ulterior motives behind the foundation's creation. So I'm going to stop right there because I wanted to just give you sort of an idea of what has been going on at the top. So then we can relate this back down to now the role that Meghan Markle and Prick Harry are playing within this whole agenda. Everything in this book or the two volumes have been thoroughly researched and sourced. So you actually have the direct sources to where she pulled this information and compiled it into this book. It's not like these are conspiracy theories. This is fact. Court documents, articles, and witness testimonies. I mean, she backs up everything that she says in this book. And it's alarming that there's a lot of stuff that the media doesn't want to report on, which makes you question and wonder the people at the top, the globalists, the people part of the WEF, are the ones carrying out an agenda that is very scary. And it's not to benefit the world, it's really to line their own pockets. This author has been doing the rounds on independent media outlets on podcasts to talk about this book. So I highly recommend if you get a chance, just search on YouTube. She's got podcasts with many independent YouTubers who are helping get the word out about some of this stuff. So highly check it out. But let's get back to our story. So now going back to the Soho House, do I believe that it was a breeding ground to connect with all these people? Yes. Do I believe that there are services in play of casting women, beautiful women, to be companions or to go sit at dinners, to be eye candy? Yes, that happens. And it's not only just the instance with Sleazy and, and his operation and setup, but there are other 
wealthy men that use this kind of setup and service. For example, Peter Nygaard. He's another one. I've seen him with my own eyes at certain clubs where he had a bevy of beautiful women sitting with him. And that was the benefit for these aspiring models who would go along with these wealthy, powerful men to get into places for free, to be seen at the hottest places. But the trade-off was they were the eye candy. You saw this kind of behavior in the Hamptons, too, during the summertime. I mean, it's so expensive out there. And what a lot of these wealthy men would do, they would bring out a trove of women to go stay with them at these houses, whatever is happening out there. We can only imagine uh, it's probably the same shenanigans that have been going on with Sleazy and Heidi, but it's happening. And I guarantee it's still happening today. The trade-off for these women is that they stay for free, they eat for free, they drink for free at the most expensive and best places that you could imagine out there. Their currency is their beauty and youth. Not all the time are they doing the things that are immoral, but they're there because they're serving a purpose. And I do believe that Meghan Markle was doing the same exact thing when she met John Fitzpatrick. I will almost bet that she was casted to go to a dinner just to sit there as eye candy. And that's how they connected. And from there, they developed a relationship where John Fitzpatrick saw her value in being associated with him. Obviously, He brought her to the White House because she saw that she could hold her own conversation, but she was also very attractive, and that looked good on him. Sleazy E did the same thing when he was going to the White House to set up their foundation. And part of having these beautiful women around him with some sort of intellect to hold a conversation in order to sell these people in the White House to go along with this master plan. So now let's go back to the book Revenge and hear what Tom Bauer writes about Megan's involvement with him. So in chapter eight, he writes, among New York hotelier Fitzpatrick's many attractions for Megan was his close relationship with Willie and Hill Lyery. In 2015, he proudly hosted Hill Lyery's fundraising campaign in the city as she sought the presidency in the following year's election. As New York's former senator and the secretary of state, no one was better connected than Hill Lyery. So John Fitzpatrick... He is an Irish entrepreneur and philanthropist, and he led the Ireland funds to the conclusion of its promising Ireland campaign, which raised around $226 million. It says here that John is a central figure in the Irish-American community running the Fitzpatrick Hotel Group in New York. He was previously named Irish American of the Year and also received an OBE for his work in engendering reconciliation in Northern Ireland. So Fitzpatrick received this OBE in 2008. And let's remember, he has close ties with Willie and Hilary. Now remember, this man was promoted as the one who influenced and facilitated these peace talks within Northern Ireland. And let's not forget John Fitzpatrick again, aligned with this man in this whole process. In 2011, he met President Bama. There he is at the White House with Megator. Then again, the following year. And then he's helping Hillary and giving money supporting the campaign for her run. There he is at the White House with Megator. Then again, the following year. And then he's helping Hillary and giving money supporting the campaign for her run. And he was there last year. Obviously, he has a very important role to play when it comes to Irish relations. But I also think it's more political than that. Here he is with Dennis O'Brien and Willie. And this was for Martin McGuinness's funeral. Now remember, it was Willie who had been fostering the peace talks with Ireland, and he was asked to speak at Martin McGuinness's funeral. For those that don't know, Martin McGuinness was Northern Ireland's Deputy First Minister. But before that, he was a former IRA chief. Now, the IRA, if for those that don't know that either, That is the Irish Republican Army, known as a specific terror group. And he was the one 
in charge when the assassination came on Lord Mountbatten. For those that don't know, that was the Queen's cousin and also main male figure in King Charles's life. So he was a part of this peace process that Willie was engaging in and then Hilary took over in making sure that the peace was kept. You can't help but wonder and ask the question, what was in it for Hilary and Willie in doing this? Remember, they had been dealing with Sleazy E as he was creating their grift, or Philanthropy 2.0. It was a big earthquake. It lasted like 15 seconds, I think. Probably the most devastating humanitarian crisis that Hillary Clinton faced during her tenure at the State Department was the tragic earthquake in Haiti. It happened in January of 2010, and literally in a matter of seconds, 250,000 people were estimated to have died, and a large portion of the Haitian infrastructure and economy was just decimated. In the days and weeks that followed the earthquake in January of 2010, Hillary Clinton made visits to Haiti. In fact, on her first visit, which occurred days after the earthquake, they literally had to stop traffic going in to the airport at Port-au-Prince. There, of course, were relief supplies that were being flown in, but that traffic was stopped so the Secretary of State could come and assess the damage. She flew in with her political aides on a large federal airplane. She landed at the airport. She made a large press conference, made statements about her commitment to rebuilding this country, and then she was soon whisked away, headed back to Washington, D.C. Theirs is a city in ruins. The international community responded in the way that you would expect it to. That is, large amounts of money were committed, up to $13 billion from international relief organizations. And of course, you had the official role of the State Department, which would be point on U.S. taxpayer dollars going to Haiti for the purposes of relief. Hillary Clinton's State Department would oversee the reconstruction effort, with Chief of Staff Cheryl Mills responsible for the allocation of U.S. tax dollars through USAID. And Bill Clinton, already appointed special envoy to Haiti for the United Nations, was named co-chair of the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission, along with a former Haitian prime minister. So this was clearly a Clinton operation from the beginning. Now, the Haitians had their own ideas about how best to rebuild their country. They wanted new roads. They wanted buildings rebuilt. And that's what you would expect. This is how you recover from an earthquake. The problem is that the Clintons had their own agenda, the interests of major donors who had a vested interest in spending that money in Haiti in ways that would benefit them. And so you immediately had this clash between the Haitians and the Clintons. And Haitians complained almost immediately that they were shut out of the decision-making process, that it was really Bill Clinton and a few of his friends that were calling the shots in the IHRC. And they made some monumentally bad decisions that not only didn't benefit the Haitian people, but ended up putting money in the pockets of major Clinton donors who had economic stakes in Haiti. Disaster capitalism in that a natural disaster creates opportunities for rebuilding to take place, but also for self-enrichment to take place. And if you look at the Clintons and the promises that were made and the results that actually followed, it is a tragic story of crony capitalism gone awry. The single largest relief project that the United States committed taxpayer dollars to, $124 million to be exact, was a project called Caracol a textile factory that was built in the northern part of the country that was supposed to create some 60,000 jobs and was supposed to create tremendous economic growth. There's a problem here already. You see, the earthquake affected the southern part of Haiti. The northern part of the country was entirely unaffected. But who were the beneficiaries of this? Companies like Gap, Target, and Walmart, to name a few. The Caracol factory was built, but it didn't create 60,000 jobs. It created barely 5,000 jobs. But the major American companies who got textiles tariff-free, made at low wages, benefited enormously. And the end effect on the Haitians was very, very minimal. If you look at some of the infrastructure projects that were undertaken, the Clintons had very grand plans to uh, build large tracts of homes. And there were contractors that were selected for those projects. Sometimes the contractors had experience, sometimes they did not. 
there's one company in Florida that spent a million dollars getting equipment into Haiti. They had experience in disaster relief, but according to the owners of that company, they only made a small donation to the Clinton Foundation. And guess what? They didn't get any relief contracts. On the other hand, the contractors who did win the awards were given the opportunity to build homes, and in some instances were supposed to build tens of thousands of homes for Haitians. They ended up building a fraction of that. For instance, the New Settlements program was supposed to build 15,000 homes for $53 million. Instead, it built 2,600 homes, less than a quarter of the original estimate, for $90 million, or $47 million over budget. And they got away with it. So you had contracts going to these relief organizations that were also involved with the Clinton Global Initiative. And you had this one organization, Dahlberg, that was supposed to do an assessment for relocating people that suffered from the earthquake. They determined that people should be moved to a site that happened to be on a cliff that was highly unstable. USAID's Inspector General reviewed Dahlberg's recommendations and found them basically unusable. One member of the USAID shelter team was quoted by Rolling Stone magazine as saying that the recommendations were so bad, it looked like the team never even got out of their SUVs. Another person said that only one of the people that was sent to Haiti by Dahlberg actually spoke French. Telecom mogul Dennis O'Brien is one of the world's richest people, and he's finding opportunities in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. The Irish billionaire is the largest private investor in Haiti through his company, Digicel, and he's now leading the Clinton Global Initiative efforts down in Haiti. Probably no one came out better in the Haitian reconstruction effort than an Irish billionaire named Dennis O'Brien. He was a Clinton Foundation donor, giving them between five and $10 million. He helped arrange speeches for Bill Clinton, too. The interest of the Obama administration, particularly the uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, you know, all the, the, all the different things that have happened to help Haiti get up off the floor have been led by the US. And he was the owner of something called Digicel, which is a cell phone company at the time of the earthquake. As part of that relief effort, the State Department run by Hillary Clinton wanted to fund a mobile money transfer service that would allow Haitian citizens to transfer and receive money on their phones. Well, Digicel applied to be the recipient of that grant money. Four weeks after their application, Digicel actually sponsored a speech for Bill Clinton in Jamaica, and they paid him $225,000. And as it turns out, within four months of that speech, Digicel would receive the first installment of that grant money. The earthquake actually has been great for Digicel and Dennis O'Brien. So whether you're talking about housing or cell phones, you see that the people that are closest to the Clintons have made out very well from the Haitian earthquake. The rest of the country, the ordinary people of Haiti, not so much. The tragedy is we had an opportunity to rebuild in a way that would give the people of that country hope. Sadly, that opportunity was squandered and what took place, rather than rebuilding Haiti, was the self-enrichment by friends of the Clintons. For all of Bill Clinton's talk about building Haiti back better, the fact remains that the most visible evidence of Clinton's role in the recovery isn't the improvement of daily life for everyday Haitians, but the construction of new luxury hotels just miles from the folks who have been living in tarps USAID handed out immediately after the earthquake. Again, let me remind you, Sleazy E was the one who helped craft this philanthropy 2.0 and set up this structure. All of them, these rich elite globalists, have set up these foundations, and it's not just for tax breaks. As you can see, there's a lot more money that can be made in venture philanthropy or philanthropy 2.0 that was created and set up by Sleazy E. And if you look at the money for the tax returns on these foundations, you can see all of these different foundations of each other, of the friends, all swapping money. So going back to Tom Bauer's book, it's Fitzpatrick, who is the one that made the connection to Hillary for this setup with the UN. So based off of what Claire's saying, I don't think it went down like that. I don't think Megan said, oh, you know what? I want to be a part of the UN women because of Emma Watson. I think Megan was tapped on the shoulder for this. Now, equality means that President Paul Kagame of Rwanda, whose country I recently visited as part of my learning mission with UN women, it means that he is equal 
to the little girl at the Gehimbe refugee camp who is dreaming about being president one day. It Paul Kagame has been praised by Bill Clinton and the Clinton Foundation. But the fact of the matter is Paul Kagame has a terrible human rights record. He's accused of aiding military operations in the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo, and that actually forced the recruitment of child soldiers. Well, because Rwanda has um, the highest um, percentage of female political participants of any other country in the world, so 64 percent of their government is female. The UN has identified him as being involved in activities that entailed massive human rights violations. You know, but these people are being given a script by the lobbyists, by the government PR agencies, that serves those agencies to get contracts. With all the problems Rwanda has had, mm -hmm. how do you explain this seemingly contradiction? I think it's really, you know, truly, and especially being there on the ground, it was so interesting to see that in the wake of obviously such a horrendous experience that they had, which was not much more than 20 years ago or so, right? We're talking something that was fairly recent. Yeah. And in that, yes, A, so many of the men were lost in the genocide, so it gave women an opportunity to either succumb to that or to then find some strength and then mobilize in a way that was really empowering. And I think that's specifically what they've done, which is a great benchmark for what women all over the world could be doing. Well, Paul Kagame is a friend of Bill Clinton's. I want to say, a special word of appreciation for the leadership of President Kagame. I'm greatly humbled uh, to receive this Clinton Global Citizen Award. He's actually given awards by Bill Clinton for his conduct as the leader of that country, and they regale him as a great military leader. This is the sort of legitimization that we don't want of these kinds of dictators and leaders. That's the kind of legitimization that the Clintons have engaged in. And they've done it in a way that creates commercial opportunities for donors and friends and allies who want to do business in Africa. The opposition parties that have been formed in the last year or two have one by one been silenced or otherwise excluded from the race. And individuals, not only politicians, but even journalists, for example, and other Rwandans who may have views different from those of the government, have found themselves at the receiving end of what has become quite a violent campaign of intimidation. Where in this uh, dilemma does the United States stand? I mean, I think what's been really interesting, and especially as you see with social media, it, it all goes beyond something that's just with a state itself, right? So with the U.S. or with any other nation, everything's become a global issue. And so I think with women's empowerment and certainly gender parity, you know, you talk about the Millennium Development Goals, right? Number three is gender equality. And I think the U.S. has been so active in speaking out on, you know, trying to have more female leaders. And I think especially watching the youth really mobilize and be involved and in, engaged in that campaign to make sure that men are uplifting women and see the same value in it. It's not just a women's fight for women. It's a people's fight for all people, right? Yeah, I've always been. In my opinion, what they do is they're not interested in real survivors because real survivors don't tend to change their story. What they're interested in is actors who can be influencers, social media influencers, oh. who they can give a narrative to. So Amber Heard and Meghan Markle and Chessie Prout and Evan Rachel Wood and all of these people, when you listen to what they say and you listen to the wording of what they say, you think, wait a minute, are you, are you original or are you reading a script? Are you, because you're all saying the same thing. You're all talking truth to power, you know, Ooh. and female empowerment. And I, I know real survivors. We all know real survivors. As you can see, this is the narrative of the globalists. They are full on trying to push this agenda. And they're using people like Meghan Markle, Amber Heard, to get this narrative out there and influence others and manipulate them. Now, the question is, with the whole feminist movement, what is actually the agenda for that? Obviously, it's not for the victims, but it is for something. Now, hopefully, after watching this, you fully understand that we are being manipulated. 
the disasters and all the horrible things that have been happening are a direct result of these globalists creating these issues. And what we're starting to see with this messaging and where I think this is going, and being that Bama really proved it with his election by using social media and twisting this narrative to influence. So could all of this fear-mongering that's going on by these donkeys be a way to condition the population in America to get accustomed to accepting the black female in order to pave a way for her into the White House and making it so that America now becomes racist if we choose a Caucasian candidate for our presidency, which we already know who is going to rerun in 2024. I think that this is a strategy because right now they don't have a better candidate. The donkeys are really assholes right now. And in order to save the party and to save the grift to keep going, you would have put this woman into office. And now you have Bama, you have Willie, you've got Hillary, you've got current President Donkey, all influencing for their own selfish gain. And she can make it happen. I don't know. I, I think that there is a bigger plan to all of this. Megan thinks that she is part of this circle and club, but I really do think that Megan and Harry are being used as pawns in this capacity. And I do think at some point, Hillary did see a potential opportunity to take down this monarchy and capitalize on exactly what they've been doing in other countries. And theoretically, if you look at what our behavior has been in the past, you know, few years, it's almost like we are colonizing people. Now, this is just my opinion. Now, Tom Bauer alludes to some of this. And in his chapter, he says, infused with American identity, Megan had abandoned any pretense of interest in British culture. Endorsed by the Obamas, the presidential donkey, and Hillary and Willie, she had become a in America, a courageous radical hero of her era. Michelle Obama and Hillary were her icons. Now, here's the thing that I want to point out. In early November, and this is 2019, Hillary visited Meghan at Frogmore as Meghan unloaded her anxiety, not least about the tabloid press. Hillary offered unqualified understanding. That's important to know. Is that why why did she make a trip to go out to Frogmore and visit her? I highly doubt it was to listen to her whine and moan. I bet that this was talking about how to set up this Archwell Foundation in the manner that Sleazy E had set up. And what do you think we have been seeing? The same exact behavior. So it's all about this pay for play. I wash your hands, you wash my hands, you follow the script, and you can be like me. I will get you into office, or if you do the right things for the donkeys, we will position you to get into office. So then you can write the script by saying, okay, you allow this amount of money for the budget to go here and there, but at the same time, you give us access. And by doing that, those people will then end up donating to the foundation. And all of a sudden now, it looks like you're trying to help the world, but in fact, you're helping yourself. Oh, and by the way, we will pay your stupid ginger prick husband a million dollars to come speak to some school in somewhere in the Commonwealth. Now you can understand why they were so focused on the Commonwealth and trying to get the Commonwealth to, to sort of separate or collapse because they didn't get their half in, half out. There is a plan around that. Imagine if you think about what I had said earlier about what Sleazy E and Heidi were doing to Prince Andrew. Think about what could have been done with the Commonwealth. That could easily be replicated if the monarchy had allowed these two idiots to have what they wanted because they were going to make money off of that by doing exactly what Hillary and Willie have been doing with their foundation. Because they are clearly aligned with WEF. 
What's concerning to me, though, when you look at King Charles, now he has become king and yes, he has to remain neutral. But in the past, he has gone to the World Economic Forum. He has spoken at the World Economic Forum. Even recent Prince William was at the World Economic Forum in 2019. So how is it that they were supporting this organization and then now all of a sudden King Charles is neutral? Does that necessarily mean that he has abandoned his thoughts on the Great Reset? I don't think so, guys. I don't think it works like that. I do believe that they are still a part of this. Could this be the major reason why they are legitimately not stopping Harry and Meghan from continuing to open their mouths and using these PR tactics to manipulate the public? Because at the same time, they are pushing the agenda, the same agenda that Prince William and King Charles were supporting when they were attending Davos. Uh, here at WEF, I believe we're discussing, um, there's a lot of discussion about what the, the new world order will be or how, even in the context of, uh, of our, our, our new Helsinki, uh, how do we f work towards that new normative international order that allows us to address our differences and disputes as the civilized world. Uh, and I believe perhaps we are at the moment in such a hyper-partisan, hyper hyper-polarized time that we're not going to be able to form uh, that new Helsinki uh, today. But I hope going forward, we are able to do, I mean, we must, we must form uh, and improve our normative and international institutional order internationally so, so that we can address these complaints. I hope this time around, once we're building this new world order or new rules-based order, the voice of the global south and the developing world is included. No, I'm, I am a futurist. I'm not a perfect predictor of the future, but I'll give you my one-year, five-year tenure. So focusing in the world of wearable technology as opposed to implanted technology, and I do believe that within many of our lifetimes, we'll see healthy people using implanted brain technology as well. Then we can decode complex thought. But as healthy people in a widespread way start to have their brainwave data collected, the insights that we can gain through pattern recognition will exponentially increase and pretty quickly. So five years from now, what we can actually decode will be massively increased from where we are today simply because we'll have a much greater data set from which we can actually create those correlations. Again, that's frightening but promising. So you have recognition memory signals that are pre-conscious and subconscious, and this is part of why it's been used, for example, by governments to interrogate criminals. Do you recognize this potential co-conspirator? Do you recognize yeah. um, you know, this murder weapon? Those pre-conscious signals, like what we call the P300 wave or the N400 wave, these are before you even consciously process information. So you could prime it with a number and then see if a person recognizes it. Um, and you can do it without them realizing that that's what you're doing. So will all of our passwords be cracked first by this or quantum computing? Hard to tell. All right. <laughs> I think uh, we're moving past passwords pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> and I it saw a hand go up. It's actually really good for passwords. Neural signatures are unique. We can use it as a biometric for passwords. You need to know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't been. Some of the vaccines that will come on down the line will be multiple. There'll be multiple shots. So you've got to have, for, for reasons to do with the healthcare more generally, but certainly for uh, a pandemic or for, um, for, for vaccines, you've got to have a proper digital infrastructure. And many countries don't have that. In fact, most countries don't have that. So, 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 so Meghan Markle, went to, when when they left the this is what happened they left the royal family in january 2016 in the middle of january they came to the states they went to stanford university and they met with the head of stanford who's a pfizer guy to and and various uh professors and academics to strategize about their altruism and then they went, and I suspect they met with Michelle Dorber because she went to Northwestern University and so did Meghan Markle. So, and, and Meghan Markle had been given a, a Vogue magazine Times Up article in February 2018. And then they went from there to the World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland, where all these bankers were really excited to see them, JP Morgan and so forth. And they and the news article said that, you know, they were being jetted in and they were looking for all these deals 
and they were expecting to make a billion dollars. And then they got their Archwell Foundation and they started Archwell and registered it in multiple different jurisdictions. It's not just these people who have a disregard for human life. It's a lot of these people. And believe it or not, Sleazy E is not the only one who is running these illegal operations. And this is part of the reason why MSM is not blowing it up or exposing any of them is because it's all tied back to money. It's not just these people who have a disregard for human life. It's a lot of these people. And believe it or not, Sleazy E is not the only one who is running these illegal underage human atrocities. It's still going on. And if you think about what's going on with our border crisis and the situation there with the youth and what's happening to them, don't be surprised if there are government officials involved allowing this to happen. This is about power and control and getting people in line to obey this agenda. Check out what they're doing already in Iran. This is Christian from the Ice Age Farmer. Iran is set to be the first country to roll out a biometric digital ID needed in order to buy food. Needed in order to eat. Right? Needed in order to survive. You must go get your digital ID from a government. The same digital ID that central banks are telling us are, is needed in order to roll out the central bank digital currencies. The same digital ID that the World Economic Forum establishes is at the very crux of this fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, all of that now, you need to go get your ID in order to eat. Now, I hope we now are starting to understand what's happening with our media, well, at least in the United States, on how suppressed all the real things that we should be talking about are considering a lot of these mainstream media companies are part of this World Economic Forum and part of this New World Order globalist agenda. And the reason why, why does MSM support this? MSM supports this because MSM is backed by advertising. Advertising mm -hmm. dollars for Pfizer, for Moderna, for L'Oreal, for you know whatever it is their programming is backed by advertising so what happens is you have the skdk the government pr companies representing time's up it's on us un women on one side and on the other side the very same pr companies representing l'oreal pfizer at&t google uber um american airlines and then at the same time, that same company, SKDK, is advising Obama, Joe Biden, Harvey Weinstein, the, U the government of Ukraine. There are also a few other PR companies doing the same thing. Let's not forget Sunshine Sachs, who is best friends with Hillary and a lot of the politicians here in New York. We also have Precision Strategies, who also was part of the whole Amber Heard debacle. It's not just SKDK, it's a couple others who have this kind of power in manipulation of messaging. Clearly now you're seeing a pattern of how we have these disasters and the direct source and the root cause of it all leads back up to these globalists. It's always dangerous when government becomes the primary influencer of young people. Whew. Yes, it's very, it's very, very dangerous. And that is exactly what is happening before our eyes. Now, if you made it to the end of this video, you're probably thinking, well, what can we do? Not very much, obviously, because they're trying to suppress your speech. They're trying to restrict your food. They're making it very difficult for you to live. Well, here's what you need to do. Don't support these global companies. And I know that's going to be hard because... It's in every facet of our lives, but you can stick with your community. And that means sticking with things that are local, right? Not supporting into these giants. We're being told lies flat out. I can speak from the United States. We see it all the time. The best thing you can do is stay informed and educated. Where you can support locally that does not 
touch any of these WEF global elites, do it. So, you know, if, if it means buying from local small businesses, now I get it. Sometimes you can't do that. But wherever you can, make that small little effort. I think we really need to treat this like a social movement. And, and just like recycling, you do one small thing, whether it be buying from a local grocery store, supporting a small business, or just supporting the citizen journalists like myself over watching mainstream media or buying newspapers from them, because we know that they're not telling us the truth. And that's all we can can say. You have to impact them where it matters to them. They don't care about human life. They care more about the dollar or whatever currency in your country. That's what they care about. So don't apply, don't subscribe. That's it. And for those that have faith, you have to ask God for help on this one, because that's the only one at this point that can really put a smackdown on these people, which I would love to see. Anyhow, thank you for sticking out this long video. I know at times it probably got boring, but I hope that the information was valuable. And please, those references that I put in this video, definitely check it out because it's eye-opening, especially Whitney Webb's books. So anyhow, let me know what you think. Don't you worry. I will be back with more content. But until then, be safe, and I will talk to you later. Bye. It's a broad. <laughs>